And we're going to talk about both larger scale and, and backyard scale methods um, that particularly work in the high desert. Um, and so in composting in the world, there's kind of a, a basic recipe of needing um, materials that are high in nitrogen. That's food waste. Um, and, and some um, fresh manure types. Materials that are high in carbon, that can be your yard waste, um, uh, dried leaves, etc. And then water and air. And so those are kind of the big broad categories. And depending on the climate that you live in, you have an abundance of, of um, water or air <laughs> dependence. And here in the high desert, we have lots of air. It's very windy, in fact, where I am this morning. Um, and we have very minimal water. <coughs> so we're taking those factors into account. We also, we have folks um, in both Canada and Mexico today with different um, climate, climate zones to consider. Um, and so that's another thing we wanna take into account as we're choosing which method of compost we use. I wanna acknowledge that there's lots of methods, um, including one of our, um, one of our participants today has pioneered an amazing fungal compost method called the Johnson Sioux bioreactor. Um, and, and that I'm only going to talk about two because they're the two that I have the most experience with. But I, by no means I wanna um, say that there aren't other ways, just that these are two ways that we've had success with on small scale, backyard scale, as well as commercial municipal scale in the city of Santa Fe. Um, share what has worked and and kind of some of the theory and and um, troubleshooting questions you could ask yourself if you're growing your um, your own composting. So I'm gonna just hop onto the screen share here, and I'm gonna start with large scale, um, but then I'm going to. I heard a lot of specific worm and backyard questions, so I'm gonna make sure I spend a little time on that today too. Um, do, 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 share the screen. Do, 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 do. Go. Is everybody seeing that? This yes, is we got that. Wonderful. So this is the cover of a resource. So after this presentation, if you're just hungry for more knowledge. A, I want you to please feel free to reach out. I'm happy to talk with you individually. Um, but then with Kavira Coalition, the organization I work with is called Reunity Resources. And in the past year, we've created a free and available resource that talks about exactly how to set up either of these two systems in a lot of detail. <laughs> I was surprised by how many pages we put into the book. Um, but this resource is available on the Kavira Coalition website. Um, and so should you want a step-by-step -step manual, um, you can find it there. And I, um, I recommend it. So this will be the, you know, we'll do the broader strokes. Um, my name is Juliana Ciano again. <coughs> I am the program director at Reunity Resources. Reunity Resources is a closed loop food system operating in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We are on the traditional unceded Tewa people lands um, and thank Eva for her land acknowledgement for the state of New Mexico as well. Um, and so what we do is we collect food waste from schools, restaurants and homes in town about approaching 2 million pounds a year and we compost that in aerated static piles. Um, and then we run a regenerative farm with um, soil that is amended with that compost. Um, so that's the, that's the kind of perspective that I'm coming from um, is, is large scale food waste diversion. We're also with Kavira, with the New Mexico Recycling Coalition and with Santa Fe County have done lots of backyard worm compost trainings. Um, so I'm happy to discuss that as well. I always like to start with a food hierarchy um, and remind us all that composting isn't our goal. Our goal is to have no food waste. And so when we have food available, our first priority is to feed, feed hungry people. And so whether that's how we're <coughs> approaching our own grocery shopping, our own gardening, 
our own community-based food systems, we wanna make sure that as much food is getting used um, to feed people as possible. It's something we always talk about when we do cafeteria trainings in elementary schools, especially. The kids get really excited about composting and remember, <laughs> Though we're happy that you're happy putting your food waste in the in the compost bin instead of the trash, we want you to eat your lunch first. <laughs> so feeding people, then feeding animals. And so if you have pig farmers or goat farmers or ranchers that can use your food that's no longer good for people, that is where it will optimally go. Then compost, because we're still capturing all of those vitamins, minerals, water content, et cetera, in the food for a value. Um, and the worst case scenario is that our food waste goes to the landfill. 40% um, of average household trash, which, you know, maybe I like to call it discards, right? Because it's not trash, <laughs> but 40% of what folks tend to put in their trash can is actually compostable, especially on a commercial scale, such as the aerated static pile system because with an aerated static pile system, um, we're reaching high heats that can break down bones, meat, dairy, certified compostable paper products, et cetera. So it's a huge, um, imp highly impactful personal choice um, and community scale choice. Whereas we know lots of climate, um, climate issues are coming from huge corporations Composting is one highly impactful individual and community scale action we can take. So who cares? Um, how, how is it impacting um, climate change so dramatically? Well, in a direct way, um, it decreases methane emissions in landfills. So if you think about a time you forgot your, you know, forgot your lunchbox or forgot some food in your hot car, um, that food waste was rotting anaerobically. And um, the word aerobic, if you think of aerobic exercise means with oxygen. So if it's, if it's um, rotting anaerobically, and means without or the opposite of, right? So when your food waste is rotting and decaying unmanaged and without oxygen, it is creating methane. And that is the stink that you get when you open your car door and realize, oops, there was a banana in the back seat or whatever. Maybe I'm giving away the fact that I have young children and there's sometimes a banana in the back seat. <laughs> um, um, and so that methane production in landfills, because our food waste maybe goes into a plastic liner in our garbage can and then into a bigger plastic liner and then gets dumped into a hole and driven over, it's just rotting um, and creating a, a suboptimal is an understatement, a, a deeply damaging byproduct of methane, which is a noxious planet warming gas. Um, so by, by diverting that, we're preventing those emissions. Then once we finished the compost um, and amended our soil with it, the power of our soil to sequester and hold carbon is much greater. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that actually works in the next slide. Um, indirectly, by keeping, by managing our waste and growing our food on a local community scale, we're reducing tons of truck transportation, both on the solid waste side and on the food system side, um, and building our local resiliency so that, um, you know, when we have global, global supply chain issues, <clears throat> um, we can feel more secure and resilient in taking care of our communities. The photo you see here, <laughs> features features Dr. Eva Stricker and Dr. Laura, I'm not going to remember her last name, um, but a gas flux expert from Los Alamos, and they've been doing tests. Um, this is our aerated static pile on site here at Reunity Resources, um, and just testing um, sites that have been amended with compost, sites that have not, and gathering data about how how this methane and carbon sequestration may be happening. Um, obviously, to come to a scientific conclusion, you need to do a lot of studies and a lot of comparison um, and analysis, but the preliminary results they're getting are really exciting about how not only the amended 
the amended um, plots they're testing, but also these active compost piles are not only not producing um, the methane and CO2, but they are actually sinking it in and sequestering it, which is very exciting. So this is why this is why I do my job is because um, because of climate change and compost being the most optimistic and actionable um, piece of the puzzle as far as I as I can apply in my life. Um, let's talk a little bit about carbon sequestration. You may hearken back to middle school and photosynthesis and the carbon cycle. And so if you can imagine a green and growing plant, right? We know the green chlorophyll um, in the plants is what gets activated with the sun to do photosynthesis. Um, but in simple terms, we can think about how humans, we breathe out um, carbon dioxide and we breathe in oxygen. But our plant relatives breathe in our carbon dioxide and essentially breathe out oxygen. It's, you know, it's not actually respiration, but for the sake of a simple analogy, we are symbiotic with plants in that way. That carbon dioxide, they you know, breathe in and through photosynthesis, they're um, breaking apart the CO2, right? That's carbon and oxygen. And the oxygen is coming out, helping keep our air clean and healthy for humans. And the carbon is being turned into carbohydrates, um, sugars, right? We imbibe carbohydrates for energy, starches and sugars. As plants turn this carbon into carbohydrates, they pump it out through their roots and those sugars and starches feed the microbiological community around those roots, making the plant happier. So they're creating um, a healthy environment for themselves and basically giving themselves a boost by, by doing that. The plant gets bigger and then it's able to perform more photosynthesis, breaking apart more CO2 and pumping out more oxygen and sequestering more carbohydrates. <coughs> so when we, um, when we add finished compost to our soil and have something growing in it, even if it's a tumbleweed, even if it's a goat head, um, we are um, building healthy soils and sequestering carbon from the atmosphere where there is too much and it is doing damage into the soil where it is an asset and it is helpful and healthy. So that is a little bit about um, the, the plant cycle. Are there any questions? This was sort of a, a theory <laughs> why we care. Any questions about how this works or how it might apply where you live? Okie doke. I don't know why that's my that's my transition word of the day. Okie doke. Um, so if you want to compost, which it sounds like many of you already are, um, it can feel a little overwhelming to determine what method is right for you. Again, I'm only talking about two methods. There are more, um, which I'm happy to you know to sort of lightly lightly discuss if helpful for anybody who's who's using those methods. Here we're going to talk about. Um, Again, this aerated static pile, which is um, a hot composting in a large scale or a worm composting, more of a residential or even neighborhood scale. So the first thing you wanna do is, is assess, we're gonna kind of go along this green line at the top. What do you have that's compostable? We use the word feedstocks. In compost talk, feedstocks are the things that you put in the pile. So that could be, uh, maybe you have a lot of deciduous trees and you have leaf waste that you wanna deal with. Maybe you're producing a lot of food waste or even a little food waste and that's what you wanna handle. I heard some folks mention horse manure, other animals, et cetera. Um, so you've got these categories of, is it food waste you're looking to handle? Is it green waste is what we call tree trimmings, leaves, grass clippings, et cetera. Basically larger plant material um, in compost land, we call that green waste, um, and then the manures. Um, so asking yourself those questions and then saying, well, how much of it do I have? Am I producing less than a five gallon bucket? Um, 
that's going to keep me in a residential <coughs> scale. Um, and if I'm producing more than five gallons, um, then I can start, um, and that's a day, right? That's a day. So I live in a household with three other people, some of whom are sometimes picky. Um, and our food waste in a week is about a five gallon bucket. Um, when we're assessing if a larger scale um, system is right for us, being able to achieve a three foot cube of feedstock is kind of your minimum functional volume for getting the, um, getting the heat levels that you would need for a hot composting process. So that's why we're looking at the volume. Um, so, so, you know, so just as a, as a anecdote, most households don't produce enough to have a, a successful hot composting system unless they're aggregating with neighbors or a, you know, sort of a small community scale. Um, yeah. So if you're, if you're on that small scale, mostly food waste, et cetera, then worm composting is what we're going to talk about. And we will talk about it. We will. Um, and if you're producing more than that, um, or again, connecting with other, um, other community members, then an aerated static pile system um, might be right for you. The other questions we have in the purple here are that um, if you're moving towards aerated static pile system, thinking about um, having some space, um, ideally with some access to electricity or water or both, um, though we've, we've gotten creative with both of those needs. Um, and then when you're talking about volume, it's nice to have access to, even if it's you know, borrowing it once a month from a neighbor, a bobcat or a small tractor or front loader. Um, otherwise, you got to have really good um, back and shoulder muscles <laughs> to be scooping that volume of, of um, food waste, green waste, and manure. Um, so that's kind of how we're assessing this. Like I said, I'm going to just talk about larger scale systems first. This is what um, an aerated static pile system on our facility looks like. Looks like a big old heap. Um, and I'm going to just tell you how it works. You see, what you largely see here is mulch. Um, and then you see some little pipes coming out of it. At the beginning of the talk, I mentioned how compost in general is a recipe of high carbon, high nitrogen, air, and water. Um, and here's how aerated static piles do this. And here's how we as a commercial composting facility decided that aerated static piles were right for us. They, so aerated, right? That, connects to the aerobic part, that manages the air. Some facilities either use a bobcat or a tractor and are just consistently turning it to try to get their heat. But we find the um, diesel emissions of machinery like that to be sort of small, to say the least. Um, and so we like the fact that it's, this is, this is like crock pot cooking um, for, um, for composting, kind of set it and forget it. Um, that we build these piles on these pipes, and then um, it runs with a fan on a timer, which I'm about to show you, and it cooks for 30 days, and, and a tractor doesn't need to be moving it, um, or there's also some large technology that's called a wind row turner. Large scale compost piles are called wind rows. I'm um, gonna have a whole vocab lesson throughout the, the presentation too. Um, so, between the carbon emissions and the, those wind row turners are more efficient, but they're a huge investment. And so the cost benefit analysis for us getting started was, well, we can buy some of this perforated pipe and a fan and a timer, and that's gonna cost seven or 800 bucks. That's not very much for a large functional commercial scale composting system, whereas a windrow turner and tractor operations and some of the larger municipal systems you see like anaerobic digestion are a, a billion dollar investment. And we loved that we could take a piece of non-arable um, desert land um, and less than a thousand dollars and get started on a big scale. Um, so these systems, this is a top view. 
Um, these systems are, again, super simple. You have a blower. It's technically um, what we use, techno technically, it's a um, bouncy house blower. So the same thing you'd use for like a birthday party jumper, jumpy jumper thing. Um, so again, like low investment, easy to access, open source. Um, we're all about everybody doing this, right? There's no proprietary information in, in, um, in our world. We think the more folks composting successfully, the better. Um, so bouncy house blower, um, outdoor, safe you know safe extension cord for your electrical system and a simple timer um for us hi, juliana yes hi we have a great question from west do you have to periodically flush the pipes very good question that's super good question we the so these are perforated pipes and i wonder i'm not um the most Zoom literate, but I miss seeing people in person. Uh, and so I'm gonna pop my face on the screen for a second um, and clarify. So these are perforated pipes like you might get for a French drain or irrigation. So you saw in the picture they're about six inches around. If my arm was the pipe, they've got like a half dollar size hole every foot. And so this is a great question because yeah, what if crap falls in there? Um, and then these pipes have a cap on one end and a fan on the other, and the cap is what forces the air up through the holes. But the important detail um, is that we, uh, and I'll show you on the next slide too, we don't face the holes up. We face them down or like at a 20 degree angle down so that the you know, air moves. Um, it will find its way and force its way through the pile, but you're exactly right. Um, if they're just facing straight up and we're putting compost straight in it, um, or feedstocks rather, <laughs> feedstocks right on top, it could easily clog those holes. So by tilting them to the side or down, the air still gets where it needs to go, but the pipes don't get as clogged. We do sometimes need to, need to flush them, um, but, but not so often. The other thing that we do is um, essentially the raw, feedstock mixture that we make is essentially in a in a complete six inch surround of dry mulch. So those pipes are also kind of in a nest basically of dry mulch um, so that those clogs don't happen. Let me get back to a slide here and a share. Oh silly. Um, that's a hold music. Um, okay, so from the side, it looks like this. The piles are between five and eight feet wide and also about five and, <coughs> and eight feet tall. And that's just sort of a, a physical boundary of, you know, of how the physics of these materials work, that it's hard to make it much taller than that unless you make it dramatically wider. And we want to have access with our, um, with our front loader to in between the piles to move the material after it has cooked for a month. So that yellow that you see is a layer. Now that we're established with a system, we use the, the kind of oversized mulch from the prior month's compost batch. When we first got started, we were just using raw mulch from the, from the transfer station here. They have you know, a wood waste collection program and grinder. Um, and so then inside the brown that you see here is the mix. What the mix is are those high carbon and high nitrogen materials. The high nitrogen for us is food waste and the high carbon for us in the high desert, actually finding carbon is harder than finding nitrogen because we don't have so many deciduous trees. Um, but what we do for a consistent supply is we work with our local transfer station and we purchase the, that ground up um, wood waste and wood chips um, from them. And so with the front loader, it's kind of like a giant cake mixer that we mix the food waste with the wood waste um, and then lay that on top of a dry mulch layer and build the pile and then cover it. 
once we turn the air on, it takes one to three days <coughs> for that pile to reach temperature. On a commercial composting scale, the industry standard is that the inside of the pile needs to reach 131 degrees Fahrenheit for 72 hours straight. And that temperature is important because it kills any pathogens. Um, it also kills most weed seeds. Um, and so reaching that temperature is really important, especially because we're taking materials from all over the community. So we don't, we don't know. Well, you know, what pathogens and what seeds might be in there. And we want to make sure that we're providing a really healthy product for the soil on our farm and for all of the farms and gardens that we provide compost to as well. So achieving that temperature, there are no secret ingredients. It's the high carbon, the high nitrogen, the air. And I, I didn't talk about the water. Let's talk about that for a second. So this mixture, high nitrogen materials, food waste, are really, really wet. Um, and so depending on what food waste we've gotten, we might not need to add any water. Um, we're usually mixing about, um, about 35% food waste with about 65% carbon. And like I said, in the desert, we actually wish we could do a higher nitrogen mix, but um, food waste is also slimy and sticky and compact. And so we need not only the carbon from those, um, from those woody materials, um, but we also need the, the fluff and the porosity so that the microbes and the air can travel through this mix um, and, they, and there don't become pockets that start to rot anaerobically. We wanna have a very homogeneous and fluffy mix. If we happen to get a bunch of really dry food waste, you know, like let's say it's a, a bakery that has a bunch of old stuff, um, that's a lot drier than, um, you know, than soup or vegetable waste um, because most vegetables are 95% are water or higher. Then we'll add some water when we're mixing the original mix, that sort of inner brown layer. The goal um, moisture is about 70%. And what that looks like or feels like, because our favorite, we joke that our favorite science is eyeballology. Mm -hmm. And that's where you eyeball it. <laughs> um, um, that 70% moisture looks or feels like freshly pressed coffee grounds or a wrung out sponge. So damp, but not dripping. Uh, and then, um, once we're at that, that moisture level, then it goes on the air, it gets insulated. And it's very rare that we need to add water after that, in part because of the thick insulation. Um, but moisture is something to be aware of. Um, Juliana? Yes. Pam is asking, would pine needles work for the wood layer? They would, absolutely. Great question. Um, oh, um, so before I move on, the, 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 the something completely different is worm composting, which we'll talk about next, but I'd love to address any questions about aerated static piles. Um, what, what's great about them besides the fact that they're um, cheap and easy to implement, and we have a step-by-step -step book that you can access on the Kavira Coalition's website, they're really super scalable. So for us to process um, this, I see this slide is a little older. We're up from 1.5 million pounds. You know, we're, we're now processing, processing almost 2 million pounds of food waste on one acre. And all we're doing is adding more systems. If you work at a community college or um, are in a community of 30 homes, you can absolutely make just one of these. And if you have 50 yards of food waste instead of, you know, millions of pounds, um, you can use this system if that's um, what works for you. And again, the exciting thing about that heat is that it can compost anything that used to be alive. Are there questions about aerated static piles before we move on to worms? There's the question about um, how do you get the temperature up 
uh, in cold weather? It's awesome. The um, steam rises off of these piles. We actually use these piles to heat one of our greenhouses in the winter through an underground kind of radiant, radiant um, hot water system. Um, the temperatures the temperatures get up there. And so this is the magic where we just feel like we're collaborating with nature. All of those microbes already exist on your food. Um, and when you're making this mix in these ratios, um, you're essentially just creating the conditions for them to do their thing optimally rather than suboptimally in the landfill. Um, and so those, those microbes operate um, and, and create those temperatures even when it's five degrees outside. We literally see steam rising um, off of them on winter mornings and snow won't, won't settle on them. Um, so it's, it's pretty remarkable. If you're, if you're in a more dramatically cold area, I'm thinking about our Alberta participant, I would recommend um, a thicker um, insulation layer on top. Um, you know, so 12 inches of mulch instead of six. Um, but I think that the, the miracles of nature are not to be underestimated. Other questions about aerated static piles? <coughs> Maria, she is asking, does this kind of compost smell a lot and where do you prepare the mix? Great question. It doesn't smell. Um, I, I live on site. <laughs> it does not smell. Um, if you're doing it right. And I'll say when we were learning that the, your, your smell is your first indicator that, oops, something's not quite right. Um, and it's always repairable. Um, you know, it's like sewing or knitting. You can always backstitch and pull, pull things out and start again. And so when we were starting, we tried a few different ratios because um, for instance, it would be much more beneficial for us to be able to have a mix that's 80% food waste. Um, but we tried it and it stunk because pockets of that mix were, um, were turning anaerobic and making that methane. And so then we said, add more carbon, add more carbon until we got to the right, the right level of fluff. Um, and so that's really exciting um, that again, a large scale composting facility doesn't, doesn't have to smell. Um, where do we prepare the mix? What we do is actually in this photo right behind it, you see some light, light wood waste. We basically, as we're rotating these piles, this will cook on its pipes for 30 days, and then the tractor will move it to another location where it will cure for about 60 days. And it takes that long for it to cool down to ambient temperatures. And different microorganisms um, naturally are happiest at different temperature echelons. So it continues to enrich, especially fungal relationships start to grow. Fungi doesn't love, um, you know, 131 plus <laughs> degrees Fahrenheit. Fungi loves cooler and moister. And so giving it that time is really important. So just behind our active piles is where we have our kind of staging piles. And so in one day, we might not collect enough food waste for the, you know, for the full pile on air and we stage it there with the food waste and basically mix it next to it and, um, and then move it with the, the front loader on top of the pipes. Awesome. And Trudy is asking, do the browns need to be shredded before you use them? In general, yes. It's all about um, the surface area. And this is true for both hot composting or aerobic composting and worm composting, that if you're not worried about the speed that things break down, they can be as big as you want. But um, the smaller and more uniform particle size um, of your feedstocks, the quicker that they'll break down because those microbes, or soon we'll talk about worms, um, have more, more surface area to access and start digesting. Um, and what we have then for our finish, finishing process is basically a giant industrial sandbox screener where the small pieces fall through and the big pieces stay. And for us, we just put the big pieces back in. Um, and so our, what we get from the transfer station, we do sometimes have sticks that are, you know, three quarters of an inch around and a foot long. And it's, that's going to take longer to break down than like a 
playground size wood chip. Um, and so if you have things at home and you're wanting to speed things up, you know, cardboard is a great thing to compost. You, um, but if you put in a whole box, it's just going to still look like a whole box in a year. But if you rip it up, um, it will start um, breaking down and becoming part of that part of that cycle much more quickly. Oh, that's really good to know. Thank you. And Pam, with our final question for this area is, do you check the temperature? Yes. There's a really fun tool that's like a three foot long thermometer. It just looks like a, like a poultry thermometer or something, except enormous. Um, and so we do. <coughs> Where our um, operations manager is checking temperature and um, moisture content regularly and noting that because um, you know, because it's a natural process and we've honed in on a recipe that works, but there are, there are variabilities. And so making sure that we're achieving that minimum of 131 degrees for 72 hours is a really important quality control step. Those thermometers are available, um, you know, if you, if you search a compost thermometer online and they're, they're not cost prohibitive, they're maybe 30, $30 give or take, um, if it's something that you're interested in for your operation. Oh, and Julia, I'd have one last question if it's okay. Of course. Uh, West is asking, do you have issues with attracting wildlife or is it not an issue due to lack of smell? Great question. We do not. We do not have issues and we're so grateful. We do, our dogs occasionally find something delicious over there. Um, but that is a, um, a major consideration in any kind of solid waste management is our, you know, are you going to be attracting what they call vectors that could potentially um, bring in disease, right? Like raccoons or crows or mice. Um, but because of the lack of smell, because it's actively aerobically composting, and because of that thick, that thick layer also acts as kind of a biofilter, right? So um, there, isn't, there isn't raw food waste sitting out. Um, and, and that's important. Um, either keeping it in its bin until you're ready to make the pile, or at least like when we do our staging, this pile behind it, dump the food waste and then put six inches of mulch on it if you're not going to get to it until tomorrow um, to, you know, to just make sure that you're not attracting those, those friends and neighbors. <laughs> Thank you. You betcha. Let's talk about worms. So I like to have a, a sort of palate cleanser slide because worm composting is actually very, very different than hot composting. And in the land of hobby composting or home scale composting, it can it's very common in our experience that people have kind of created a hybridization of different styles of composting and some are compatible and some are not. So the main thing here is that on a large scale, we're talking about heat and we're talking about aerobic activity and microbes. Um, when we're talking about worms, if, if our worm compost heated up to 131 degrees, we would no longer have worms in it. Um, and so just acknowledging that the conditions we're trying to create <coughs> for worm composting are pretty different. Um, and um, yeah, so worm composting typically uses the red wiggler worm, um, which is Icenia fetida. And I think in Latin, fetida would mean stink, right? Like fetid, but I don't know what Icenia means, maybe just like a a general, general worm, um, but that's kind of funny. Red wiggler worms are not the worms that come up on the sidewalk after it rains or that you can dig in your backyard and find, at least not in New Mexico. They are not an endemic species here. Um, what does come up from rainstorms or what you might find happy in your, in your healthy soil in your garden are groundworms. Groundworms are super beneficial and we love them. Groundworms love to digest carbon because that's what exists in the ground, right? Fallen leaves, grass clippings, um, et cetera. 
the reason that red wigglers are what's recommended for backyard composting is that they like a lot of the same food that humans like. Um, and so again, they're not an endemic species to Northern New Mexico. Um, so you get to order worms online <laughs> if you need worms, or you can come to our place to Reunity Resources and we, and we sell worms. A friend of ours, um, Sam McCarthy sells worms at the farmer's market. You might, have, you might have a person in your community, either at the farmer's market or the bait shop who has them locally. Um, but if you're looking for worms, um, you can also go to unclejimswormfarm.com and they will arrive in your mailbox. Um, what I think is nice to think about with worm composting is that like, again, rather than creating heat, you're trying to create an environment that your worms will love so that they keep eating and pooping and eating and pooping. Um, and so what do worms love? Um, a lot of the same things humans love in terms of temperature, they like it to be around 70 degrees and they will tolerate winter and they will tolerate summer, um, but they love that, that kind of happy middle ground that, uh, you know, that a lot of humans also feel comfortable at. Um, and so <clears throat> again, we're not turning our worm compost to try to create heat. The worms are doing the digging and turning for us. Um, and creating their environment. What we want to give them is comfy bedding um, with carbon, nitrogen, air, and water. And so um, this is kind of a cross section, maybe it makes sense. So this is kind of a demonstration of a straw bale worm bin getting set up. And so we recommend this because you don't need any construction skills. You can absolutely build something out of pallets or build something out of materials that you have on hand. You can buy a plastic bin. Um, ultimately, we're just looking at some form of containment. And here in the high desert, the other reason that straw is helpful is because of that air and water balance that I mentioned. We have a ton of air and it's hard to keep water places where we want it. And so this protects from the wind and holds in more water than, for example, a, a hollow cage made out of chicken wire. If you live in a place that's really humid and gets a lot of rain, that hollow chicken wire cage might be just perfect. Um, and so that's what it looks like as it's getting built. This is what it looks like on the side. So you're just building it straight on your soil. Um, making that rectangle out of straw bales. And then we start by laying down, um, um, doo -doo -doo, by laying down some straw or dried leaves or whatever kind of carbon material. But we like to make them a, a bed um, that's maybe three to four inches thick. And then we like to get that moist. Again, if you live in a place that's always, always humid, um, that's a, less of a concern. But here, when we're getting them started, we spread out the carbon materials we have, and then we, um, and then we add, you know, a gallon of water, a, a watering can's worth, so that it's moist. Then we can add in our worms and our food waste that we've been storing um, in our kitchen. And those are our greens. There are a couple of exceptions with worms um, of things that, that we don't recommend. So I talked about how the high heat of aerated static piles can compost meat, bones, dairy, certified compostable coffee cups, et cetera, et cetera. Um, worms don't want any of that. Um, with backyard composting, we recommend staying away from meat, staying away from dairy. Those two things have the most propensity to stink um, and attract things that you may not want attracted to your pile. Um, any kind of fruit and vegetable matter is a yes. There are some preferences. The worms do not love citrus and they do not love onions. <laughs> um, but I like to think of it as a spectrum um, where on a home scale compost pile, you're probably putting a huge diversity of things in because it's based on what you are eating and drinking. And so if you're not making, I'm, I talk about eyeology. I also, I'm, um, you know, lazy would be one word, efficient would be another, <laughs> um, depending, on, depending on the lens you wanna see it through. 
when I'm cooking, I like to chop up all of my vegetables and then put all of my materials into my bin. And if there's a little bit of onion in there, that's gonna be okay. If I'm not making French onion soup for 50 people and only giving my warm onions, for me, I'm okay with that onion bit breaking down more slowly than the watermelon rind because worms love watermelon rinds. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and that's sort of a, a personality assessment of do you want to be really precise about what you put in there or do you not mind if six months later you're still seeing some orange peel because worms don't really want to eat your orange peels. If you don't mind the orange peel, put it in. It's not going it, to, again, if you're not um, running an orange juice shop um, a little bit in these different spectrums is just fine. Same is true for you might have heard different things about um, about coffee grinds and the different sort of acid and alkaline levels. If you're making a regular amount of coffee um, and it's mixed with other food waste, great. If you're a coffee shop and wanting to only feed coffee grounds to your worms, your worms aren't gonna be that delighted. Um, we often say if you are eating a healthy balanced diet, your worms will be too. Um, yeah, and then we cover it with, with a nice layer of straw. We're saying straw here because in the high desert, we just don't have, we, we don't assume that backyards have um, deciduous leaves or other carbon-based materials. If you've got a tree, um, you can save all of those leaves and use those for your bedding layers. Um, and this is kind of your, your basic start. And then once it's a, once, once you've done this, you basically rinse and repeat that you're adding, and there are kind of two ways. People will either add their greens and then add more carbon if they have it. Um, but here, sometimes you can keep that top thick straw layer or leaves um, and just kind of lift it and add your food waste from the kitchen each, each time um, under that same carbon. When we have um, problems, when people, um, feel like their backyard compost isn't working or it's starting to smell. In the high desert, the answer is almost always add more carbon, add a little moisture, and give it a gentle little fluff with your pitchfork because maybe some of those, maybe some of those greens, those food waste um, bits have kind of compacted and are, and are going anaerobic. Um, and so we want to just fluff those in with carbon, make, make room, make them more appealing for the worms to dig into. And that usually resolves itself after adding carbon, water, a gentle fluff, and then, um, um, and then it takes a little time. It doesn't resolve instantly, but usually within one to two days. Whoops, Suze, that was exciting. Um, questions so far about worms? Yes. Pam is asking, um, or Pam, would do you like to ask the question yourself? Or? Sure. So I was just trying to figure out what I did wrong. I ended up with way too much water, but I was also doing it in a container. Um, I had gotten the worms from a neighbor who was very successful, and I kept trying to get her to come by, but I couldn't. Um, so I'm seeing that you have different components, but I just couldn't get the, the moisture to drain. Mm -hmm. And then I guess at what point do you combine it with, combine it with your, put it out to your dirt? Yeah, great, great questions. Um, yeah, so getting the moisture to drain, that's where, depending on the kind of system you're using, <coughs> we like this one because it's right on the soil, so it drains right in, but there are some kind of container and indoor systems, um, and it's kind of a management of, of, Again, probably adding more carbon to absorb that moisture, or potentially the system might just need, need some more drainage. Some, um, some then, my, got it. Uh, well, I've tried, I mean, I've put so many holes, it just wasn't, I don't, it was kind of odd, but I might try the outside one. But here's the concern is we get a lot of cold temperatures. So, how does that work with all the freezing temperatures yep. in the winter yep. and so the hot in the summer? Exactly. Yep. Yep. The worms slow down for us. Um, I'm in, again, I'm in Santa Fe. We get, you know, consistently single digits and sometimes under in the winter and up to a hundred in the summer sometimes too. This is where that thick layer of straw on top is helpful. And also 
making sure there's enough moisture. The worms are very good. They do slow down, just like humans. If it's really hot or really cold, they slow down. So they're not going to be producing as much compost as quickly, um, but they will find their way to the temperature pockets that work for them. In the winter, we often add another six inches of carbon. Sometimes we add a tarp. We have like, now installed bins in lots of folks' backyards. And sometimes people, um, people have something, you know, they have an old storm window that they can balance on top in the winter. So they get a little more solar. Sometimes they put a tarp or a, a rectangle of carpet or a piece of plywood. If you want to, to add more layers of cover in the winter, you absolutely can. We, we did last year, we just added a tarp with extra carbon. And then, um, yeah. and we had no maggots. don't tell. But then we didn't do anything with our pile for like two months um, and, and it was fine. And so that's where we, we have the analogy in our, in our book of um, you know starting a compost pile isn't like adopting a puppy, like, but it's not that high needs, but it is sort of like, you know, getting a hamster. Like, can you, do you have the mental space to know that this exists and know that it needs some, some food and water. But if you, you know, if you um, are traveling or something, give it a good feeding, keep it moist, keep it insulated. It will, it will be okay. Your worms will, will find their ways. Um, the worst thing that would happen if you had an extreme cold snap or, extreme heat wave is that your worms would die. Um, typically they'll, they'll kind of leave the pile looking, you know, look, and that's also why it's good for to be on the soil. But like I said, especially in the high desert, since they, they don't live here, they, they don't want to eat clay and sand. Um, and so they, here, they typically stay somewhere in your pile. Um, and if they would happen to die, then they are enriching your compost in a different way. Um, and, um, and then get, getting more from that neighbor or, um, whatever your source is, um, is the, the path forward. But we have seen our worms survive a lot of, of heat, a lot of cold, a lot of neglect, um, and they, and they do their thing. If you have a deciduous tree to put your bin under that, you know, or, or an area that's shady in the summer and not shady in the winter, but... That's a, again, that's a tall order, especially in New Mexico. Um, so just adding insulation, both in, in both situations, both extremes. And then in the summer, making sure that they have, making sure you're eating enough watermelon for them <laughs> or, or, or otherwise just keeping the bin moist enough that because the, the moisture will evaporate more quickly, of course. Thank you. I have three yeah. questions. Sure thing. Um, so one is about moisture. How moist? Mm -hmm. Same, same as the um, as the mix we start with on the aerated static pile. So we say about seventy percent moisture. From an eyeology standpoint, that means the same as fresh brewed coffee grounds or a wrung out sponge, damp but not dripping. If you put your hand in and it's bone dry, add a little water. If it's dripping wet, let you know. Add a little carbon, or just let it be for a little bit. Generally speaking, um, if folks dump their <coughs> dump their food waste and then rinse their food waste bin right there and dump the water, um, it makes you keeps your kitchen sink cleaner. Um, but that that's for many people around here. Um, that that's a um, a reasonable way to keep them the moisture content that they want. Okay, and second question, I have a lot of leaves. I have a big tree. Um, are leaves okay for, rather than straw on the top? Absolutely. Yep, yep. Leaves are, in, I would say, desirable because you already have them and um, probably in abundance. <laughs> so, um, so yes, leaves can be exchanged for any, any place that says straw or carbon. You can just put leaves, leaves, leaves. Okay. And my last question, um, you said meat, cheese. Um, I ate a little bit of cheese, very little. Is a little bit okay in the compost? I, that's where I would go with, yeah, it's all on the spectrum. And if you're not putting a, 
you know, if there's a, a roast chicken carcass, that's probably going to attract a, a neighbor's dog or who knows, you know, but if it's like a, a, a soup bone here and there, it's, it's not going to break down quickly, but if you don't mind it just sitting there doing its thing, then it's no problem. Thanks. There was a question when we were introducing ourselves, there was a question about worms and manure and how they could combine or not. Um, and it's a really good question. Um, if you, and I would put it kind of in the same spectrum situation. Um, and I, um, yeah, so let's, let's talk about poop for a minute. <laughs> um, um, worms don't want to eat your poop. Um, that is a different type of composting. If you're doing, and <laughs> I happen to say your poop, if you're interested in human manure composting, um, that's its own style. It's totally functional. It, it's important to hit that 131 degrees if you're making human manure compost. Um, but that's probably a whole nother session. I won't try to squeeze it in in 10 minutes. Um, your pet's poop. Pet poop is a no-no. Um, your worms don't want to eat dog poop and you, when you're harvesting your backyard composts, do not want to reach into your pile and get a handful of dog poop. Um, pet poop tends to be pretty pathogenic. Um, domesticated animals also have really different digestive systems than, um, than wild animals um, and they tend to eat really weird diets um, and so their kibble etc. just doesn't break down. It's not desirable. Don't do it. Um, poultry, larger animals. I think, um, I think it was you, Tacey, and I think you said horses. Um, all of those manures can be really great for your soil, but your worms don't necessarily want to eat them either. Manure tends to be what we say is <coughs> hot or really high in nitrogen. Um, um, but again, the, the worms don't want that heat. So what could happen if you have a little bit, if you have a rabbit hutch, if you have some chicken poop and you have a worm, you know, a home size worm composting system, what I recommend is that a little bit can go in. I don't, again, I don't want to like inundate my worms with only chicken poop because they don't actually want to eat it. They want to eat my food waste um, and be in that nice, cozy, moist environment that I've created for them. Um, but if I go food waste and then my carbon, and then I'm like, oh gosh, I need to do something with this chicken poop. And ultimately I want it to end up in my garden. I could add it right in there, add a layer on top of my carbon, and then just make sure that my worms are having, you know, having an ample ratio of the food waste that they want. And I would just keep adding on after that. But I wouldn't do that with large animal manure and worms. I would keep those systems distinct. Um, manure can be a great thing if that's your only feedstock. Um, the kind of lowest effort is to just let it age, just let it sit in a pile for six months and then use it. Um, and there are some rules about food safety if you're using it on your edible garden um, and, you know, the, the time periods that you should let it age before you're growing, um, you know, your cabbage in it. Um, but that's a low, a low impact way to handle manure um, or manure can be great with wood waste or food waste as well. But on a home scale, worms don't love poop. And that includes pig manure? That does include pig manure. Also, yep, also on the hotter side, I would uh, let, let it age and apply it to some soil, maybe, you know, maybe where you're growing um, trees or again, not, if, not your carrots the first year. <laughs> what about horse manure? Same, same. Yep, I, I, um, worms don't necessarily want to eat it. Letting it age or working, I mean, it's something that we do, so there might be something in your community. We have tons of stable owners that bring their horse poop, um, goat poop, etc. here, and then we incorporate it into our aerated static piles, but if it's just you and you have the space for it, letting it age at home and then Post it on your neighborhood social group. People people want your aged manure for their land. Um, they'll come pick it up. <laughs> um, but I wouldn't mix it with worms. Awesome. And Trudy's asking, 
Will you also chat about worms and containers as well as in terms of setup on the small scale? Yes, uh, specifically indoor worms. Is that um, the hope, Trudy? Like a um, like a worm apartment kind of thing. Let's see if we get through. Well, Tacey asked, how long should the manure age? A minimum of six months. In terms of worms and containers, you like um, there are some lovely, they get called like worm apartments or worm condos, little stackable things that you can keep if you if you're <coughs> um, you know, if you don't have backyard space, if you don't um, I don't know, if you want to keep your worm pets closer to you, um, they can be great. Um, they can fit under your sink or on your countertop. And the management is largely the same. I would just be even more careful with what I put in and with what my particle sizes are. Because if I have a smaller container, um, often they have these kind of levels where the, the worm, you feed the worms on one level, they eat and poop and eat and poop and eat and poop. And when there's no more food there, you've started adding food base to the next level and the worms look for the food so they find it. And then you have compost here. If you have really high variability in what the food scraps are and what those sizes are, um, that transition just isn't going to be as effective. So like if I have a whole potato or something and then the rest is like chopped up salad, chopped up salad is going to turn into compost in the form of worm poop really fast and the potato is going to take a long time. Um, and so if I'm doing it in containers, smaller containers, I would just chop up my food waste smaller um, and make sure that I was kind of uniform with the particle sizes I was putting in those containers. But otherwise the same things apply with um, carbon to nitrogen ratio. Um, we eyeball it in, in home scale, we eyeball it at about one to one. Um, so like if I'm doing a bucket of food waste, I'm rinsing that out with water and then I'm adding about that same bucket of leaves or straw or shredded cardboard um, to keep, again, to keep those air pockets and, and ratios correct. And shredded, <clears throat> can shredded paper be used with the it worms? Can. Yep, it can. And the shredding is nice. It, you know, whole pieces of paper will take a long time and blow away, but the shredded is nice. Um, I also like to get it wet or make, put my food waste on top of it just so that it doesn't blow away because it's windy where we live. Um, I see another question. Is there a difference between aged manure and the final product of a pile with other inputs? And the answer is definitely yes. Um, and one of the most important things about when manure gets added to a composting system is that we hit that 131 degree temperature and we kill any weed seeds or pathogens. If your horse eats hay, <laughs> there will be hay seeds in their poop. And then when you put that, even if it's aged manure, you will be planting yourself some hay or some rye or whatever it is that they've had um, in, your, in your landscape. And in a lot of places, that's okay. If they've been eating goat heads, though, like you might be planting yourself some goat head seeds or some tumbleweed seeds, um, et cetera. And so that's where the, the high heat composting process can be nice. Um, it also adds, you know, that composting process adds different microbiological um, facets that just the manure alone wouldn't have. But again, in sort of a, what's the easiest way to handle this low, low impact, um, letting it age is, you know, perfectly acceptable. <laughs> I have a small open um, warm composting pile and I don't have anything around it. I don't have straw barrels or anything. It's just completely open. Should I um, put something around it? I would recommend it mostly, mostly for critter control um, and temperature control. And it could be, yeah, like it could be four pieces of plywood, you know, whatever kind of scrap or reuse you have around, it doesn't have to be anything fancy, but I would recommend it just for, just for um, cre creature control. Um, and I do wanna say we are coming right on up to time, um, but 
especially for backyard scale composting, I want to point you all to a video in the New Mexico Cycling Coalition. And it's about a 15 minute video that will walk you right through it. Um, and the best, I think I can share the link, but if you search backyard compost in high desert, we'll get you there. Um, let me just... Oh, Juliana, you're starting to turn into a robot again. Um, and I'm back. Maybe it's because I clicked onto that YouTube link and it started loading. But anyways, there's a, there's a, a, a 15 minute video that shows how to do it with straw bales, how to do it with a like a black plastic bin, um, and and talks more about that backyard scale um, that I just popped into the chat. And of course the book, Eva, do you have the, the link to the book real handy? Because that would be the other resource that I'd love to, for people to like. Thank you, I posted it a couple times, but for folks that jumped on later. Excellent. Thank you. Um, do we just dig down and shovel or travel out? Great, um, <coughs> great questions. What do you do once you've made compost? I really appreciate that. With worms, what I like to do is feed it in one quadrant of my bin for a week or two. And that will draw the worms to the fresh food waste so that I can then dig in the other side without worrying about my worm babies so much um, because they'll be more concentrated by the fresh yummy food waste. So that is my kind of quickest, easiest. And then you do just you know, lift up your, your um, carbon insulation layer and dig out the sides where you haven't been feeding. Um, if you're using one of these container systems, um, the worms tend to work their way up and you kind of dig, dig in from the bottom. But on the straw, I just yeah pick a corner, feed it there, and then harvest from the others. You can make a little, I mentioned we have like a giant industrial sandbox sifter. You can make a, a home scale version that fits over your wheelbarrow with some two by four and hardware cloth, um, which, you know, which is just a, a big screen. And if you'd like to sift it out very finely, um, that's a great way to do it. I find also that I'm a, I'm a not picky person. And so I don't mind if, um, if there's an orange peel in my garden bed. Some people are very meticulous about their gardens. And, and in that case, I would you know, sift or, or pick out any visible pieces because it won't be, it won't be 100% homogenous um, unless you sift it. Um, and then your worm compost is like a super powerful multivitamin. You wouldn't want to plant directly into it. Um, you would want to mix it in if you have a, you know, like an eight by four garden bed. Mixing that wheelbarrow of compost into it before you plant could be an excellent boost for your garden that season. Um, if your garden's already planted, you can sprinkle a couple of tablespoons around the bases of your, your heavy feeding plants like tomatoes, peppers, corn, um, and water it in. That's called top dressing or side dressing. Um, and that, um, again, puts the nutrients in. It also puts, introduces all the different micro um, bacteria and fungi to begin proliferating in your soil um, and setting up those healthy feedback cycles. Um, were those the, and then do we just add it to soil or use it alone? Yep, mix it in. So this last question, water heater insulator around containers. Um, <coughs> um, sure, I'm all for it. Um, if, you're, if you're getting down to temperatures, I think you might, I'm picturing that kind of like reflective spaceship insulation stuff. It, yeah, if you're getting to temperatures um, and have an idea about how to keep it a little warmer, sounds like a great easy solution. I'm all, yeah, many, many ways to achieve it and lots of creativity that people bring, which is part of what makes composting fun is it's kind of, you get to add your personal flair to it. I have a question about the sifting. So I have a um, the hardware cloth, quarter of an inch hardware cloth that you were describing that I put over my, my wheelbarrow. Um, but the worms, some of the worms slip through that. It's, yes. 
it's okay. Um, is my if you if you're seeing them and want to grab them, um, great. It's also okay. Um, I guess I'm. <laughs> I walk this line of being very attached to my worms, and also um, if a couple are going into your worm compost and going into your soil. And again, like I said, in New Mexico, they're not probably surviving a super long time in our clay and sand, um, then, um, then it's okay. Worms make a lot of worm babies and they tend to keep their, their population in control. Oh, and that, I had another note of an earlier question about space and reduction and do you need to add or move your worms? If you have a, an abundance, definitely give them to your neighbors. We find that we that we rarely have to remove or add worms, that they kind of keep their own populations in check between having babies and dying. Um, and also your pile. I feel like our worm pile is always one third to one half full. No matter how frequently <laughs> I'm adding stuff, your feedstocks, to your finished compost, the reduction is gonna be like 70%. And so depending again on lots of factors, you might only get one wheelbarrow compost from your backyard for a whole year because that reduction is huge. And again, we don't want to be creating tons of food waste. We want to be feeding people. Um, so, so if you feel like you're not getting very much compost, that doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. Your food waste really does reduce an average of 70% in volume. And with that, unfortunately, I'm gonna to have to break in. Um, let's uh, thank Juliana for, for her time and uh, the, you know, all of the trial and error that has clearly contributed to how much knowledge she has it always inspires me to think of it as a process and not as trying to do anything perfect because conditions are going to change. Um, so uh, as I put in the chat, the best way to compost is whatever way works for you. Um, but we are available, especially if you're in New Mexico, do reach out to us. Um, we have some funding where we can provide some more technical service. Um, that for now, unfortunately, it's focused on New Mexico, but um, you know, sneak in a question if you're from farther away, we're happy to talk or, or answer emails. Um, and Juliana just put her email in the chat. Thank you, Juliana. And so once again, thank you, Juliana. Uh, look forward to hopefully seeing some of y'all in person next week and otherwise I'll see you on future uh, webinars this week. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thanks everyone, take care.